Dominica swears in its new ministers after the Labour Party's landslide victory. Caribbean leaders express their solidarity. A Chilean court accepts a case against the president for crimes against humanity. And the search for oil in Kenya's Rift Valley is destroying the lands of local communities. Hello and welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo. This is From the South. We begin in Dominica, where ministers of the newly elected Labour Party government have been sworn in. The ceremony took place in the capital, Rosal, with the prime ministers of Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados and St. Vincent and the Grenines in attendance. Roosevelt Garrett's Labour Party won a fifth term in office in the elections on December 6th, taking 18 out of the 21 seats in Parliament. The landslide victory silenced attempts by the United States and the Secretary General of the OAS to question in the elections. I know that this country is not for sale. And I know that this country too will never ever be subject to a coup by electoral observer mission. We do it the fair way. We start to line up, polls open at 7. We start to line up at 5 o'clock. And we provide a quiet yet deafening answer to those who would want to subvert the will of the people. And very quietly, the people of Dominica gave the message. And from it, I know, and the world knows, that heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. And sweetest is the quietude of voters in a free country lining up to vote and electing their government in an atmosphere of peace, tranquility, and security. The Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Modli, congratulated Roosevelt Skerid on the number of women elected for the Labour Party, and she congratulated the people of Dominica for giving an example of resilience after the devastation caused by Hurricane Maria. Without more, I want to say to the people of Dominica, you have been through turmoil. You have been through more than most on this earth can even contemplate. That the people of Dominica stand tall today, stand resilient, <laughs> is a matter of pride, Prime Minister, not just for you in Dominica, but it is a matter of pride for us all. You have borne the brunt of what the world has foisted on us with respect to climate crisis. But like good Caribbean people and like those who went before us, as Prime Minister Gonzalez said, you have dusted off, you have stood up again, and you have said we are ready to continue the battle for our people. But I want you to know that as you do that, my political party commands of me the pursuit of regional integration and comradeship. And I therefore stand here today conscious that we have come to public life in Barbados not only to make a better life for the people of Barbados, but to work in solidarity with the people of the Caribbean. And it is for this reason I have come today to share with you in this moment of renewal and reaffirmation. 
A court in Santiago has accepted a case against the Chilean president, Sebastián Piñera, for crimes against humanity. The case against the president was brought by an opposition senator. It charges Piñera with responsibility for the dramatic, dramatic Bien, increase in eye injuries suffered by protesters as a result of police repression during the last two months of Chile's uprising. More than 350 people have lost partial or complete vision as a result of wounds, mainly from rubber bullets. The Constitutional Commission of Chile's lower house has passed 13 articles dealing with preparations for a new referendum on a new constitution. They call for a plebiscite on April 26 to ask Chileans if they want a new constitution and how it should be drawn up. They include provisions for gender parity and reserve seats for indigenous communities. The proposal will go to a vote in the full house on Wednesday. The Mexican government strongly rejected the proposal by the U.S. Congress to send so-called labor inspectors to Mexico to oversee the implementation of the trade agreement between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, which seeks to replace the North American Free Trade Agreement that has been in force for 25 years. President Andrés Manuel López Obrador rejected that the trade agreement between Mexico, the United States, and Canada, known as the USMCA, include foreign agents who would monitor compliance with labor reforms in Mexico. They propose that every six months U.S. inspectors come here, something that was not in the original agreement. It was a clandestine maneuver, even though they have every right to present any initiative. The Foreign Minister Marcelo Ebrard says that this proposal by the U.S. does not endanger the agreement, as it is an internal decision that has no legal basis to be enacted on Mexican soil. The U.S. officials cannot inspect any establishment here because our laws don't allow that. They will never be allowed to do such a thing. From Washington, the Mexican Undersecretary for North America and negotiator for the USMCA gave details of his meeting with his U.S. counterpart. The only visits to the national territory that can be made will be in accordance with procedures and rules set forth in the treaty through independent panelists and selected by each country. However, trade unions in Mexico question the unilateral nature of the provision, especially considering that the United States has a record of violations of labor rights. This is somewhat a violation of our sovereignty, and it's embarrassing that such an announcement by the U.S. would make our government implement labor reforms. In 2019, the Mexican Congress was forced to approve constitutional amendments to workers' rights in order to continue renegotiating the USMCA that will replace the North American Free Trade Agreement that has been enforced since 1994. This agreement is good news in the short term for Mexico and for the government of Andrés Manuel López Obrador because it creates a better situation for investors for the market. But many worry that in the long term, prosperity for Mexicans may be a broken promise, as inequalities between Canada, the U.S. and Mexico remain. Moving on, Bolivia's deposed President Evo Morales gave a press conference in Buenos Aires, Argentina, where he said the coup against him was carried out because the right-wing opposition couldn't stand that he redistributed the wealth among all people. On May 1st, 2016, we fulfilled the mandate of the Bolivian people, of the social movements, the campesinos, indigenous people, workers and teachers, of the nationalization of our resources. And the old giants said they wouldn't invest in Bolivia. And at that time, former president Nestor Kirchner said the Argentine people will be our partners. He called me and says, if they don't want to invest, I will do it. Morales also said that he will fight to resolve the situation in his country and answer to the call of the indigenous people who demand democracy and sovereignty over their resources. Presidents of the capitalist system proclaim peace, but I am convinced that there won't be peace if there's no social justice. 
if the dignity of the indigenous people is not respected. Peace is not assured by setting up military bases or interventions, or stealing natural resources, whether it be mining or oil reserves. And us Bolivians have fought against it, and we believe another world is possible, that Bolivia can exist without the participation of the International Monetary Fund. That was our biggest crime, and this was also a coup due to our lithium, because the future of energy is based on lithium. In no time it will sustain all our energy. The Venezuelan Foreign Minister Jorge Arreaza has been discussing the situation in the region with the president of Suriname, Desi Buters. Arreaza posted a video of their meeting in Paramaibo. He said it was an honor to be received by Buters, to whom he conveyed the support of President Nicolás Maduro. The president of Suriname is currently appealing against the court's decision to convict him for murder. He denies the charges and says the verdict was politically motivated. The coffee production sector in Honduras is in crisis as the deal with fewer workers and a drop in production when compared to, to last year. Our correspondent in Tegucigalpa, Gilda Silvestrucci, reports. Coffee production in Honduras usually creates around 1 million jobs per year. But this year, production has been threatened by the massive migration of Hondurans who are fleeing poverty and violence. Around here, people abandon the farms because they are losing money. Here in Santa Barbara, migrating in hopes of reaching the United States. In 2016, according to official data, over 1 million tons of coffee were sold. But the drop in workforce this year will only allow sales to reach just over 700,000 tons, equivalent to $250 million. On top of this situation, there is a rise in the cost of supplies and the effects of climate change. We are motivating producers so they realize that climate change is real and that it affects everyone. Also, that coffee is a crop that needs to be grown in the shadows. It needs protection from the sun. To fight the drop in workforce, many farms are hiring people from the border region with Guatemala and El Salvador. And the lack of male workers has also allowed more women to be hired. In Honduras, there are 120,000 families who live from coffee production. And now they have to deal not only with the effects of climate change, but also forced migration. According to statistics, this year more than 200,000 men left Honduras in search of better work. And women have taken on their roles at the farms, in both production and management. In several farms, women have integrated more, in management, on the field, and in other ways. The crisis in the coffee sector goes hand in hand with deteriorating highways, high prices for good, and a lack in competitiveness with foreign products. Many people are forced to leave farms, which in turn makes salaries less appealing. There has been serious problems for the crops, because we don't have enough people. In the past we didn't have problems, but now we had to bring product from other places, because there are no people to pick our crops, even if the coffee is good. Currently, Honduras is the sixth largest exporter of coffee in the world, and 95% of production is in the hands of small farmers. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Thousands of Algerians returned to the streets to protest against the newly elected president. Demonstrators rallied in Algiers, rejecting Abdel Majid Tebboune, who won 58.1% of the vote in Thursday's election. But protesters dismissed his victory as illegitimate. They have vowed to continue with demonstrations until all remnants of the former administration are out of the government. We are in the streets to change the system. They did not listen to our demands. If that were the case, the movement would have stopped. They've changed people, but not the ideas. We want them to change the ideas and all the system. 
Sudanese citizens have decried the economic hardships they are facing due to sanctions imposed by the United States. Business people in the country have expressed concern with operational challenges which began decades ago. Most recently, additional officials have been put on a list of sanctioned people. Washington has renewed the sanctions, accusing the country of allegedly supporting rebel fighters. We can't make further investments on spare parts because we cannot open a bank account without a letter of credit. There are absolutely no transfers made from a bank inside Sudan to a country outside Sudan in a convertible foreign currency, whether in dollars, sterling, euros, dirhams, or the Saudi rial, nothing. There is never any transfer done through the banking system. The Libyan government has deployed military reinforcements to Tripoli in an attempt to pacify the fighting in the southern part of the capital. The United Nations recognized Libyan National Accord government has announced that it has dispatched the military reinforcements as the Khalifa of Tarled forces continue their offensive in the area. Hundreds of people have so far been killed and several displaced since the clashes began in Tripoli. The damage caused by climate change is often exacerbated by abuses and violations on farmers' rights. In Kenya, where an economic model based on oil drilling has led to flooding and droughts, farmers are forced to migrate in search for a better life. Over the last few years, two transnational companies have been exploring Kenya's Rift Valley in search of oil. Recently, they held a celebration, as many believed they'd found what they were looking for. Isaiah Biwot, born in this village, is a volunteer in an organization that represents the community's demands. They're condemning the World Bank for financing this oil exploration. The community's resilience depends on agriculture, including cattle and goat breeding. Nevertheless, each year, young people leave the village in search of an easier life. The young men are more, more interested in planting season starts from April and ends at uh, Agaste. But this year we had no rains from April, May, but we received a very short rain in June, late June, uh, late June and July. So but our harvest was very, very, very little. In one acre, expectation, people would expect to get something like a report 25 bucks by one, one acre. But this year, the, 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 the first person who maybe say the harvest a lot was uh, five, six in one acre. So it was very poor. No, 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 no. The heavy machinery of Tullox oil passed through here. Without any warning or request for permission, they ran over the community's crops, causing damage that hasn't even been paid for. Total, total money they paid me is 8,000. Rains are not practicable. So during the year that we, we don't have any rain, the mango starts the best, and it will help people economically to get money. Because one mango, one mango fruit, you can sell at 20 shillings, but the list is 15 shillings. But one mango can hold up to 1,500 seedlings times the number of the, 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 the trees you have. The invasion by the transnational's heavy machinery damaged the land in this delicate ecosystem. The, these trucks they used, they were very heavy. Mm. So they go, when they, when they enter inside there, yeah. they, they felt that the, the trucks will sink. So they come back, they used to now here. So the, 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 the caterpillar, the creator now went through here. So you see, when you see this side and the other place, it is raised, but here, it is the question. I am so, even seeing the rocks. Yeah. So this is now the rocks. Those people, there is a lot of rocks. Never removed them. Up, so. it, was, it, it, it was a, a flat area, it was balanced. So when you see, yeah, when you stand here, there is a, this like an inch. This land, when it's yeah, not it's raining, it's not productive anymore, like before. And even this type of tree, across where there is the water table is high. Now that the water table has gone down because of the crack, the, the kali, they will start drying up. According to the community, the explosions carried out by tallow oil during their exploration caused a huge crack that lowered the level of the river. We started witnessing this now. The issue of food security is now a problem. Wetlands are going to disappear. Somewhere here. And then after that, the use of this very high explosive during the seismic surface, the, the cracks started developing because it developed along that line up to the other side. But the lower side, which uh, there was no uh, seismic survey done, is was intact. It was tall Family crops now depend on unpredictable rains to produce some food.
The community's complaint against the World Bank is based on violations by the same company. Communities have not only gotten no benefits from the oil exploration of their land, they weren't even asked before it was done. What's more, their livelihoods are in danger from climate change. Climate uncertainty comes on top of the legal insecurity they face because the government hasn't given them title deeds for the land they live on and have taken care of since the time of their ancestors. We'll be right back. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. The Vatican has announced that priests can no longer cite papal secrecy and sexual abuse cases. The move by Pope Francis comes after thousands of reports of sexual abuse around the world by priests and accusations of cover-ups by senior clergy. Per the Pope's latest instructions, the pontifical secret no longer applies to accusations, trials and decisions involving cases of sexual abuse. Former Pakistan military leader Pervez Musharraf Raf has been sentenced to death for high treason charges. A Pakistan court sentenced the former president in absentia for having subverted the country's constitution to extend his rule. In November 2007, Musharraf suspended the constitution and imposed new emergency laws, triggering nationwide protests. He seized power through a coup in 1999 and served as president up to 2008. He is currently exiled in Dubai. This case is all wrong. We have said this before too. We have said it ten times that this case is wrong. All cases related to this case are also wrong, because this case should have been filled by the Interior Secretary with the approval of the Cabinet. The emergency that Parvez Musharraf declared on November 3, 2007, was done on the advice of the Prime Minister and with the consolation of everybody and all the stakeholders. China and Russia have jointly called on the UN Security Council to lift sanctions imposed on North Korea. The two countries have proposed that the Security Council consider a draft resolution that will lead to a consensus on easing sanctions. The United States maintains that North Korea must remain sanctioned, a move that would jeopardize the nuclear and missile program talks, which the two countries have been holding. We hope that the Security Council will speak with one voice in support of a political resolution to the peninsula issue and encourage the United States and North Korea to respect each other's concerns and show flexibility and sincerity and meet each other halfway. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Stefania Bravo. Until next time.